Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation today. Two NHL general managers, Calgary's Brad Treliving and Kyle Dubas of the Toronto Maple Leafs, two spokespersons. And I don't know if you heard, but earlier today, City TV revived their iconic Speaker's Corner, a little booth in downtown Toronto, and it's also in the modern world on the website, and they're using the hashtag for social platforms, hashtag speak up. Uh, It's a blank sheet. It's obviously an opportunity, an invitation to you to have a voice. And it got me thinking with respect to these two men who do a lot of speaking on behalf of organizations, have leading voices in Canada. It got me thinking about this bookshelf and the times that people do not write. As an example, Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. He went another 30 years before he wrote again. And the idea was that he respected literature too much to repeat himself. Arthur Rimbaud, the great Rimbaud, 17 years without writing. J.D. Salinger wrote The Catcher in the Rye. And then he retired. And there's other reasons uh, for silences. Uh, A lot of cultures, it was an oral tradition. So their genius, their writing uh, is simply lost to the platform. Uh, Women, as you know, and I'm proud, there are many, many books on the shelf uh, by great uh, leading female authors. Uh, But women were told, look, you create life. Why would you worry about creating art or political discord? Uh, So that's changed. Uh, But, you know, I I feel like myself, a lot of things have died uh, inside me as I think I need to know more before I speak up or I write. Uh, And I I recognize in these books, uh, most of the great work of the humanities has involved not a few hours or weeks or months, uh, but actually a life wholly dedicated, wholly surrendered to the craft. Substantial work takes time. And that brings me to Kyle and Brad, two men who've lived their entire lives in their craft, in their vocation. So it's Brad for living, Kyle Dubas, lives lived in hockey and their chance to speak up. The general manager of the Calgary Flames, Brad Tree Living. Brad Tree Living is a respected guy in this business. He has a keen mind and he has a reputation as an extremely hard worker. I'm a proud Western Canadian. You are a self-made man. This has always been a passion of mine and wanting to have success here with this team. And I fully believe that this organization, this team is on the cusp of doing good things. I do think we are. It gives me great pride to announce Kyle as uh, the new general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I've been working in hockey every day since I've been 11 years old. This has been my life since I've been very, very young. We will be a better organization if this young man becomes a part of it. The Marlies are Calder Cup champions! Calder Cup champions! To me, working in Toronto, a lot of people say you know, it's, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of media. I think that's one of the great honors of of having this job here. I wouldn't want it any other way. Really pleased to have Brad and Kyle join me. And men, I said in the preamble that you've both spent your life in the game. uh, And I I wanted to sort of imbue uh, your life's experience in hockey with your life's experience in dealing with people uh, as a manager, as a spokesperson. So Brad, you first. Uh, This eight days, uh, I know the clubs have issued statements, but what are you feeling? Well, feeling a lot, and I don't think um, I'm either smart enough to articulate. You know, lots of feelings that go through. I think all of all of us um, have watched the video of the incidents um, or the incident um, uh, in Minneapolis, and and your heart just goes out. I mean, you just your heart goes out to um, you know the people involved there, and then you. To me, it's a time to look um, internally and how can, you know, how can you help? How can you play your part um, to do what's right? Um, And so you, I think you, to me, you always have to look internally first before you can look externally. Um, Obviously, we had the issue that we dealt with um, this year. And uh, um, so it's, it's, it's been something that, to give a lot of self-reflection of how can we, you know, how can we be part of the solution um, and do our part? And like I said, I don't, um, you have all sorts of feelings. Uh, anger um, is one to see what's, uh, what's transpired and, and, and try to heal. Um, and, and so that's, I guess, over the course of the last uh, week or so, that's, that's probably the best way to articulate um, what we've been going through and, and how do we play our part to make sure that, uh, you know, we all move forward the proper way. Kyle. Yeah, it's, uh, I think Ron, it's, it's a very difficult, um, 
matter to relate to for any of us that are that are sitting here now in this uh, on this interview um, as a white person who grew up in northern Ontario in, in a community uh, comprised of mostly other white people uh, I did not have much interaction I've never been the subject to racism and in, have, was educated in, and brought up in a way that all people were equal uh, and that we should merely uh, in our family abide by the golden rule of treating other people the way that we want to be treated. And I think what the last week has shown us is that uh, merely um, living a good life yourself and treating other people well yourself and treating other people the way you want to be treated, it, that's great, but it's not uh, quite good enough in order to enact change uh, in the greater swaths of society. And um, I think what we've learned, especially in the last number of days, is that uh, with the Maple Leafs and with our players and with our staff, and more importantly in our community and throughout the world, we need to be doing more on the anti-racism side of, of things, not only with our statements and our words and our tweets and what we put out there, but uh, with our actions. And we know that people will be watching us and holding us accountable in that regard. And I think one of the most positive movements that we've seen internally, not to speak on, on the whole societal issue um, or injustices that have been done, is that our players and, and our staff have all been reaching out asking us what they can actually do rather than what they can say. And um, I think we will certainly uh, become more actionable on the topic and, and show more leadership on the topic uh, as we move forward, which is probably something we should have done earlier, but we'll certainly do moving ahead and uh, I know in, in knowing Brad and, uh, and the Flames and, and the way that everyone uh, is viewing this, it's a time of reflection to see where we can go and, and where we can make an impact uh, to ensure that this that's been going on for a long time uh, is put to an end and, and we all move forward as a better society. Your contemporary, Masaya Jury, did an op-ed piece uh, and I know has been uh, a real ally for, for you in understanding the role that you and the Leafs can play, Kyle. Yeah, I think for Shani and myself and for our whole organization, having someone like Masai uh, as part of MLSE is, is uh, such a, a, a great bit of fortune because not only in times of, of crisis or when there are certain events that bring different injustices to the surface, uh, Masai is always uh, very vocal and very adamant about this topic and ensuring that, that we're not being quiet just because uh, either Shani or myself or anybody with the least has not been the subject of racism. It doesn't mean that we can't be doing things and speaking up on things and raising our own voices to, to confront and defeat it. And having somebody like Masai uh, work with us uh, with the Raptors and, and at M MLSE is such a tremendous amount of, uh, of good fortune for us and, and something that we'll look to, to guide us as, as we, uh, as we move ahead here and, and uh, get actionable and show leadership on this front, which is something that, as I said earlier, uh, we all wish we would have done sooner. Who, you had Akeem Alou, obviously, uh, with the Bill Peters resigning and being let go by the organization in the same breath, uh, Brad, you had to investigate racism. Um, who have you leaned on uh, to learn, to go forward? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, Ron, is just, you know, as Kyle said, um, I, I can't put myself in, 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 you know, the shoes of, of, you know, whether it be Akeem or, or any other black player um, and say, I've experienced what they've experienced. So to me, it's about education. Um, you know, we've had um, lots of discussions internally. I've talked with, you know, when we went through um, our situation earlier in the year, talking with Oliver Shillington on our team um, and just trying to get an understanding of, of, you know, ensuring number one, that, the environment that we have here has not put him in any position that I'm not, I'm unaware of um, where he's felt uncomfortable or not felt like any other player. And he assured me that that was the case. And, but you got to go, as Kyle said, you, we have to, we have to do more. Um, you know, we have to, we have to educate ourselves. So whether that's talking with people that I know, um, which we've done friends, um, you know, people within, within, in and outside of, the industry um, and and reading and lear learning and and trying to educate ourselves, but you know it all it's all going to come down to actions. You know it, we can talk and we can, um, like I said, we can make statements, but ultimately it's how we live our lives. And 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 like I said, I I to me it's not about 
making statements as much as it is about learning what um, the injustices that have gone on and the people that have had to deal with it and really trying to learn from them um, to ensure that this this doesn't happen anymore. And when I said earlier, it, it, the anger is because I, as, as Kyle mentioned, I, I grew up with that um, sort of that that way of life that you just treat. It doesn't matter where you're from, uh, the color of your skin, um, everybody's treated equally. And to know that people have had to endure um, not being treated equally, it, it does, it makes you, it does make you angry. And so to me, the, the, in, in a position of leadership, you have to learn and understand uh, what it is that they've had to go through um, and ensure that uh, you become a voice that that, that doesn't continue. That's a, a huge revelation that our blind spots. Uh, Kyle, if you want to touch, the last thing I'd ask you on this is uh, about that, the blind spots, because uh, we three agree that uh, we, we didn't know what to look for. So consequently, that's not an excuse, though. That, that's the biggest thing is you can't go by sympathy, which would be just kind of soft uh, racism. You, you can't go by uh, shame uh, because that won't be constructive. And you certainly can't go by it was a failure and, and move on. Uh, you do need that action. So has, has anything come to light in terms of what you think we will be doing, Kyle? Uh, I think what we've taken our time to do um, on this on this piece, Ron, is certainly I think take the lead from uh, from people in our own organization who have been uh, been at the at the forefront of the action parts uh, of this uh, societal issue for uh, for quite a while, and uh, and then also in the last couple of days uh, begin to as as our players and our staff have asked, what more can we do? Uh, we've begun to investigate different groups in Toronto, in Canada, and in the United States that uh, that our people can be involved with, uh, whether it's donating their time, uh, donating their platform uh, and, and visibility to those different groups, um, or, or financial uh, activism, uh, any one of those three elements. And, and what we're trying to do now is build out a proper protocol that where, where we can educate our, our entire organization, uh, meaning the Leafs, on... Uh, what organizations they can get involved with if they want uh, in any of those three regards and, and how we can help them moving forward as well as what organizations can help best educate our own group internally. So that's where we're at right now. It's, uh, I, I won't uh, hide it. It, it is uh, reactionary rather than being proactive, which I certainly wish we, we were. And, uh, and that's on me and on us. Uh, and the fact that we are reacting versus uh, having a plan in place and, something we, we will be better at as we, we move ahead. But uh, this is where we're at. We know we need to lead and act on it, and we will. Thank you. Uh, Brad, you, you can certainly chime in on that, but uh, we'll go to hockey. Uh, your job, obviously, uh, the prospects of a return to play. Any new? I, I heard that Congressman, and I know neither of you knows about what's being said in this call, Roger Goodell, Gary Bettman, uh, Congressman Steve Scalise, uh, who is the minority whip in the United States from Louisiana, was going to have a call about uh, the return of professional sport. Uh, what, if anything, uh, can you tell us, Brad, about what you're hearing right now? Well, probably not a lot different than what uh, what you're hearing, Ron. Is I guess it was last week when the when the league and the players' association announced the return to play protocol um, and really going into phase two, um, which we will be going into here soon. Um, we we suspect and then ultimately into phase three and then ultimately into phase four, which is the, um, the qualifying rounds and into, into you know, concluding the, the 1920 season. So really a lot of our energies are, are being spent right now and just preparing for that. You know, we've got no other new information than, what, than what's been out there publicly in the last week to 10 days. So what's, what's taking up our time right now is just preparing um, our facility for the for the time that when it does open all the protocols that need to go in place um, and there's a lot of them and so educating uh, all of our medical staff and they've been they've really been on the front lines of this from day one in terms of communication with the league to make sure that we're, we're going to be in a position to um, when when the facilities do open follow all the protocols and then the biggest challenge right now you know specifically for for you know Kyle myself and the Canadian teams is you know, I can, I can speak for the Flames, but we don't have a lot of the players here in town. Um, you know, the majority of our guys have left and in some cases have left the country, whether it be in the United States or Europe. So, um, you know, how, how we are going to, um, you know, conduct, if you will, phase two 
um, knowing that the regulations that are in place right now with with quarantines and those types of things. So we're just we're educating ourselves on all those types of issues, um, speaking and and communicating with our players on a regular basis to make sure a they're they're healthy and continue to be healthy, um, and that their families are the same. And then slowly get get back to a situation where we're we've got them in town and and uh, whenever that date comes and and right now the dates you know we're still a little bit unsure when we are going to officially move into phase two um and then phase three with training camp i think the, the latest has been that the camps will not open before july 10th so although there's some dates that are still um haven't been solidified we're just trying to do all the things that we can do to prepare um so when the go-ahead happens we're we're able to react and uh, and implement so that's there's a lot a lot of moving parts going on and that's really that's taken up our time right now ron kyle um very similar to brad and i, I think most of the other canadian uh canadian teams um we we're faced with with two uh two items number one and I think we're, we're just a little bit more fortunate in that a lot of our players are, or a good number of our players are from Toronto or from the area, or um, they've elected to stay here for family reasons or, or injury reasons or, or what have you. So we have about, uh, I think we have about 13 players that are here and then another four or five that are quarantining uh, and abiding by those rules before they're able to get back up and going. So we're, we're focused on ensuring that our facility meets the guidelines and, and you know, checking off all three of the guidelines we need to meet, either the, the highest of the NHL, um, our Toronto Public Health and Ontario um, Health Ministry guidelines for the, our MLSC internal guidelines, which uh, govern our facility, the Raptors and, and TFC. So uh, we spend a lot of our time working on that and, and, um, you know, and then working on constant communication, as, as Brad stated, with our players who aren't here on and uh, trying to give them guidance on when they can come back, what's going to happen with the quarantine act and the quarantine rules. Is, is there a chance that uh, an essential worker could quarantine at, at their workplace and at home rather than uh, just an isolation 24 seven in their home um, because the, the players don't want to leave where they're at until they, if they don't have to potentially in time uh, just be in a condo or in a hotel for 14 days and they can remain in their home, whether it's in, Sweden or Finland or Vancouver or Scottsdale, Arizona, um, and uh, where, where they have greater access to their own workout facilities and, and various other uh, amenities. So we're, we're spending a lot of our time navigating that and then you know trying to get a sense from our players, as, as Brad indicated, as what they want from us during this next phase, uh, just in terms of ice times and structures and um, you know it's 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 really their um, their prerogative and their situation. So. Um, you know, it's a voluntary phase. And, and so we're, we're trying to get from the players as much as they need uh, and what they want from us before, before we move it along. So uh, we don't have any experience dealing with any of this. So I find it's been very time consuming and, uh, and not, uh, we're not having the answers or not having a playbook you can go back to from the past or in anybody's past makes it challenging. But I, I think that the league has done a good job on, on that side of it and letting us know what the protocols are going to be and how stringent we need to be. And, and now it's just ensuring that we can execute and, and uh, when the players do return to the facility. Brad, playbooks. Uh, I'm hoping you've read this one. Uh, this is one of the many books on my shelf, and I really love it, especially him talking about goaltenders being the split between a team and a golfer. Uh, it's a long story. you got to buy the book. Um, I'll, you complete this sentence. Brian Burke cuts you. Brian Burke hired you as a general manager in Calgary, but Brian Burke also fired you as a hockey player one time. He said the uh, only way you're going to get into the Pacific Coliseum, Brad, is? Buy a ticket. <laughs> With a ticket. <laughs> Here are books that Burke has given me. Boys in the Boat, fantastic story of the 36 Olympics. He's given me this one on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Books. Are you a reader, Brad? Yeah, I am. Um, and uh, I thought I read. I thought I read a lot. Uh, before the, you know, we got into the last nine weeks, it seems like uh, um, the reading has gone up. So certainly, um, um, you know, I, it's, it's funny during, during the season, you're the biggest challenge I always found with this job is time management. You know, I found even the first, you know, the first little bit of this, this job was, um, it felt like you, you looked up and it was seven o'clock at night every day and you wondered where the day went and, and even trying to get some time to do 
some personal things. And, and one of them is reading. I enjoy reading a lot. And uh, um, so as you, as you learn to, at least from my end, learn to manage your time better, you're, you're able to, um, you know, tackle the next uh, great book that, that's on the bookshelf. Um, but certainly in this time, it's allowed us to um, meet, do a lot of things, spend some time with um, probably the longest time I've spent as a family with my wife and two daughters. They haven't voted me off the island yet, but that could be coming any day. And, uh, um, and, 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 and read a little bit more. So uh, I have read that book that you brought up there a little bit time ago, a, a couple of times. Um, We've got a rule. We got to read that every six months in the family. Yeah. Um, but no, it's the one benefit I would say of this whole time is, you know, professionally, it's allowed me to do a little planning that you you certainly don't get in season. You know, we reach the seventy game mark, and you're usually, you know, at a real busy time of the year where you're in a playoff push, and you're, you know, you're doing all those types of things. It's allowed us to, you know. I, after the first initial couple of weeks when you thought maybe this was going to be a short, you know, a short pause. Um, it's allowed you to do a lot of planning, you know, with our staff, you really look at a lot of the things that we do is there a better way, a better mousetrap to build. Um, and, and then personally, it's allowed us to spend a lot of time um, as a family and enjoy some things that maybe we nor normally don't do. Um, and I have curled up with a couple of, uh, uh, of good books here the last uh, the last what, couple of months for what, sure. What books, Brad? <laughs> I'm dying to know. Nonfiction, work related, or fiction? Yeah, work related. Um, um, it, it, it's it, it's goofy. I just started it. I, I'd had it on my bookshelf, and I know with uh, all the events that took place here in the last number of months, but Astro Ball was one of the books that I had just started. <laughs> um, and then obviously the story came out about the Houston Astros. And I said, you know what? I'm still going to finish the book. It, it, it gives you a little different slant on things yes. after, uh, after um, you read that. But that's in terms of the, the latest book I read, that's, that's the latest book. So Kyle, I know you're a voracious reader. And I, I, with you, uh, my story is Lou Lamorello. 2003, I'm at the same hotel as the New Jersey Devils. I give Moneyball to Lou. And he, a week later, sends me Vince Lombardi's Execution and a book by Yogi Berra. And he, you know how Lou is, too. Uh, so over to you. What are you reading and, uh, and how you've used both literature and nonfiction uh, to help you with your work? Oh, and the nonfiction, uh, the, the, the fiction and literature side, I, I, I have to say I'm not great at. I, I did... Uh, I did have one uh, fiction book that I started at the beginning of this, and, and I've I've moved back into more of the uh, the nonfiction area of it. Um, I, I like to read. I find um, I, I think it, I just call it what it is. My experience uh, in in hockey and, and in management is is uh, is not as long as Brad's and and many of the others that um, that are managers in the league. So. I, I try to view reading as a chance to learn some of the things that they would are, have already known from their experiences in, in life and in hockey that are um, that are longer than mine. Uh, the the books that I've I've read over the break I, I've I've got right now um, uh, the Team of Teams by Stanley uh, McChrystal. Um, it was recommended from uh, some of the uh, the other people that I've, I've taken the time to talk to in other sports during this break, and I think Brad touched on it. I think this. Um, this break has given a, a great chance to, I've only been in this job now for two years, but you realize pretty quickly that over the two years you have, have had very little chance to kind of hit pause and take time to plan and learn and unlearn different things that may have uh, impacted you negatively or positively. So, um, that's, that's really where, where I spent most of the time in the break. I've, I've finished reading, uh, stillness is the key by Ryan holiday and, and enjoy uh, many of his books and, and um, and I'm going to get on to Essentialism by Greg McCallan uh, next because it's been recommended by a lot of people. But try to read as much as I can and, and uh, try to learn as much as I can from those readings, Ron, and, and uh, roll from there. It was great when Max Kerman had uh, a Tessa Virtue, of course, and Morgan Riley on the show, and he'd received a book from you and he wouldn't let on what it was because <laughs> it deals obviously with uh, something he can learn and why would he reveal that? Uh, one interesting thing that you just brought up, uh, this time, this pause, if I'm Sheldon Keefe, if I'm Jeff Ward, I've got four months 
to develop a game plan for the Winnipeg Jets and the Columbus Blue Jackets is unbelievable to me. I mean, we may not see a goal in these series. Uh, Brad, you're, <laughs> you're first on that, this this crazy amount of prep time that you have to go face, which is interesting because you're going to face Kevin Shevel day off, who is your teammate with the Brandon Wheat Kings, and you're going to face Blake Wheeler, your first ever number one pick, right? Yeah, well, Blake was was chosen. I wasn't in Phoenix then, but not certainly. Yet? Okay. Uh, but yeah, Chevy and I go way back. And uh, um, well, they, first of all, they're 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 a really good opponent. And it starts, I think, with ownership. It starts with Chevy. He's done a wonderful job managing that team. Um, and I think Paul Maurice is one of the very best coaches in, in the NHL and a great coaching staff. And then he goes into, into a deep team that's that's really good. So I think the key too, though, Ron, as you as you mentioned. Um, and we've talked about it as a staff, obviously you're going to do the coaching staff is going to do their preparation and you're going to, um, you know, you're going to break down the opponent and, and, and all those types of things. It's a little bit unique situation with us in Winnipeg this year, because we've only played actually two of the games that we had left, uh, mm-hmm. were against Winnipeg. And the one game that we played them this year, uh, was the outdoor game. So it's, you know, I don't know if you're going to be going back and watch a lot of that tape. Um, I joked with Chevy, we could play each other six times and neither game, and none, no games will be in either of the cities. So um, we played our first game in Regina. But I think one of the things is you got to be careful of too much paralysis by analysis here. Um, there's only so much you can do in terms of preparing for an opponent and, and the uniqueness of what we're going through. I think a lot of our preparation, certainly it's going to be preparing for 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 Winnipeg and like I said a, a really really good team with very few holes I haven't seen any yet but um, I think because of the time off and the uniqueness of, of this pause a lot of your preparation is going to be internal preparing your own team you know and and preparing your own team not only to play an opponent but just get back and 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 you know doing what getting to your game and you know, like I said, we're going to go through a phase two where guys are going to be sort of in, for lack of a better term, individual sessions and, and small groups. And then you're going to, you're going to, you know, morph that into a training camp. But I think the teams that can get back to their game or get to their game, both individually and collectively, Mm. the quickest are going to have the most success because nobody's, you know, and, and to the earlier question that Kyle talked about, there's no playbook for this, you know, we can look back at, uh, and we, we've 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 dialogued with teams in different leagues and different sports on coming off of breaks, but there's really nothing that you can point to back in your history to say, well, this is what we, you know, this is how we, this is not like a two week break between a series or, um, you know, it's it's just so unique. So I think a lot of the energy, and I think most teams um, will may say the same thing. A lot of the focus is going to be on what you do um and getting back and and whatever you want to implement maybe there's some new tweaks but getting to your game as fast as you possibly can regardless of the opponent is probably going to be the 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 biggest key here moving forward well with respect to uh, video brad kyle used to always like to say with more to do with scouting your mind and your eyes are uh, lying sons of guns uh they will play tricks (laughs) on you so that's right uh you, you kind of do lean on some data once in a while to assist uh so could it be youth could it be cohesion teams that have been together longer? Could it be goaltending? Could it be these coaching staffs, you know, the Jack Adams trophy winner lineup? What do you think would be uh, some of the data that you'd examine going into this new playoff? Well, it's always goaltending, Ron. I mean, that's number number one. You, you, uh, you, you made a point from, uh, from Jim tree loving's book there that, that I think hits it right on the head. I mean, goaltending is always important and is vital to the fortune of every team that's, that's going to be returning. And so, a part of the, a part of that is on us getting our, our two goaltenders and probably three and four goaltenders ready for competition and, and whatever that, uh, whatever they may need to be at their best. But I think Brad hit it on the head. A lot of our focus is going to be internal. And the one thing that we've already um, shared with our players and, and with our staff is that I think the, the key uh, benefit will come to teams that are in elite condition and elite shape that are able to, have their fitness level very, very high as they come off this. So in the in phase two and phase three, you're able to put the proper amounts of work in and be guided properly by the team's strength and conditioning staff and be able to be in, in great condition 
um, because you're not going to have uh, three weeks of training camp and exhibition and then 82 games of regular season to, to find your best. You're going to have to be at your best right away. Um, in, in our case, you know, we, we have, I think it, our benefit is that we know that our opponent is going to be extremely difficult. Um, they're, they're a very good team. They've built a strong identity and culture in, in the way that they operate and the way that they play in Columbus. They're extremely well managed by Yarmo and, and Bill Zito uh, and, and their staff. And we know that uh, Torts is one of the best coaches in the league. And Sheldon, of course, played for Torts, has gone through his training camps, and he knows what they're going to be like. So um, we know what they're about. We know how good they are. Obviously, they showed last season in the playoffs the damage they're capable of doing. So there should be no surprises for us. And, and our, our major focus is, is on our own conditioning and being up to up to uh, the test with them and the type of level that they're going to display against us. And um, I think it's a great uh, challenge for our group as we're young and growing and, and uh, continue to build our own identity and try to reach our own potential. And it'll serve as a stiff test right off the bat. And, and I think we're, we're excited about it. Um, but we have to look after ourselves here in the short term. And then in the last number of weeks, probably shift our attention towards preparing most for Columbus. Right. Notwithstanding the, the social, the economic, the health crisis we're going through, uh, it would be such a lift, uh, men. And you, you both represent, uh, obviously, Kyle, uh, your grandfather, Walter, was uh, you know a player who's in the Sioux Greyhounds Hall of Fame. You're a stick boy at 11. You're the GM up there at 25. That's hockey. And Brad, um, Tony Curry wrote uh, when I was interviewing Bob Nicholson about billeting with your dad and uh, you. You know, you were a five-year-old boy. And uh, Tony Curry's a player I respect from the Maritimes very much. And yeah, hockey through and through. So the two of you, uh, thank you for this today and good luck when and if we get back on the ice. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Just makes you pine for the return of the NHL, doesn't it? Our thanks to Brad and to Kyle. A reminder, we're back Friday, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on In Conversation. As always, we'll close with a song lyric and today, come on, talk to me so you can see what's going on. Yeah, what's going on. Marvin Gaye. Thanks for watching today and so long.